Intramuros was the biggest European city in Asia. It defines our culture. The problem is most of our officials do not appreciate it. It's important because it's part of our history, part of our heritage, and one of the few physical evidences uh, remaining of uh, the uh, Spanish period of Philippine history. There are many good stories about Filipinos, people who headed the construction of the walls. The carvers were Filipinos also. It was a very exciting time. That's what I remember most, having a restoration force as big as Intramuros was at the time, well, didn't exist anywhere in the country. When we came into Intramuros to work, uh, what are we restoring? We do not know how did it look except for the ruined walls. That's why we have to, to dig pictures and pictures and pictures just to be able to, to provide a background. And in the early days, it was really a dead town. Even when Casa Manila was finished, we would make whatever pakulo just to bring in people. Uh, the greatest satisfaction I had was uh, the presence of a good team uh, because uh, basically the three of us uh, were the ones who set the initial uh, directions of uh, the Intramuros administration. Since last year, I'm really amazed at how Intramuros has grown and has attracted so many people considering the problems we had in the beginning. There are thousands of people coming here and all of them are paying. Entrance fees, restaurants, every, all those calais. Can you imagine? It's alive. You have many people saying that Intramuros should not be preserved because it is a colonial memory and that should be erased. I don't think so. So it's about time that our people should see Intramuros is not just a symbol of colonialization, but a symbol of our spirit to rise above that. Intramuros for me is a place that tells you the story of Manila, the city that I was born in, the city that I worked in, and the city that I live in and will probably live in for the next um, years. My life with Intramuros began in 1999 when I started volunteering for a museum, uh, Bahay Chinoy. And it was from there that I started uh, doing cultural work, and eventually which led to us establishing our tour outfit in 2005. Intramuros is a place of a lot of personal memories for me, because I've been coming here since I was a little boy. I remember my first trip here was in the 1980s when we had a school trip at San Agustin Museum. And I distinctly remember getting freaked out because I went to a crypt with lots of dead people and uh, which nobody really explained what they were. So that fascination with Manila's history, with my personal family's history, began here in Intramuros. I think what we do here in Intramuros introduces people to our city. And by introducing Intramuros to our visitors, we tell them the story and we make them understand the city, my city, Manila, why, what it was, how it is today, and what it will be in the future. 
My hopes for Intermuros is to be a place that is anchored in its past, but at the same time, it's a place that can have new ideas for the future. No? A place that will inspire people. A place that will create good memories. And a place that will make you feel good about being a Manilenio. I'm Ivan Mandi. I'm a cultural guide from Old Manila Walks. And we have been doing historical walks around the old city since 2005. I see myself as a cultural worker and a storyteller. Uh, and I tell basically the, the story of our city. And the story of Manila uh, begins here in Intramuro. Every great and important city has an old town. Intramuros to me is Manila's old town. I have always been awed by Intramuros. It seems like when I'm coming here, there is an excitement that you feel that what happened in this place. There is something so sacred, so noble, so precious about Intramuros. Uh, I named it after uh, my grandmother, Barbara, uh, to just give it a Spanish flavor. And uh, for some years, for uh, after a few years, we decided to really gear towards heritage so that people will see and know what is heritage, what is sinauna, yung kinaugalian natin, yung traditions natin, which will be seen in our cuisine and in our uh, performances, in the dance that we present here in Barbaras. I would attribute it to my mom, to my mother, who taught me the value of work, the value of uh, excellence, uh, the value of uh, feeding people in, in, a, in style and giving them satisfaction. 
I would want to happen, that Intramuros will be remembered by every person who comes to this place because of its uh, uniqueness, its sacredness, its history, its everything. There is so much here. I'm Barbara Gordon de los Reyes of Barbara's Heritage Restaurant. I have been in Intramuros for the past 30 years, which has been uh, a great part of my work, my joys. It's like an adventure. I'm uh, Martin Tino Jr. My Lolo became chairman of the Comelec, and he was the one who transferred the Comelec to Intramuros. I was in grade school. He would go home at 6 o'clock every afternoon. They pick us up at 4 o'clock, so I have to wait for him in his office. So I would go around Intramuros in the 19, early 50s. It was all ruins. I've always been interested in old houses. I began traveling throughout the whole country. Intramuros was the biggest European city in Asia. This is our history. It defines our culture. The problem is most of our officials do not appreciate it. IA was founded. And uh, Jimmy Laya, I didn't know Jimmy Laya. He got me as a consultant. Then we started having exhibits. Uh, the first ever on relieves, on santos, on ivory. We have all these horrible looking modern buildings. I wish they could tear it down and rebuild it properly. And in the early days, it was really a dead town. Even when Casa Manila was finished, we would make whatever pakulo just to bring in people. In the afternoon, Intramuros was empty. Empty. There was hardly any people. Since last year, I'm really amazed at how Intramuros has grown and has attracted so many people, considering the problems we had in the beginning. There are thousands of people coming here, and all of them are paying the entrance fees, restaurants, everything, all those calais. Can you imagine? It's alive. You can see the whole thing is alive. As I always uh, say before, no, whenever we say uh, Manila, Manila was of course in Tramuros. And uh, during the Spanish period, and it's, it was their prime uh, city. No? And so everything that was um, about Philippine history and culture during the Spanish and of course the American period uh, began and eventually developed you know, in the walled city. And in the course of time, no, this uh, would become also a uh, prime urban tourism area, especially with the restoration and the heritage conservation that has been going on in the city. I think the biggest challenge for Intramuros is for it to be incorporated into that modernization without affecting the historical heritage of the walled city. I mean, accommodations can be done for the modernization that is happening. Uh, internet, telephones, you know, modern facilities for tourists, but it doesn't have to come at the sacrifice of what existed there 
before. You know, I think that's one of the biggest challenge until today, you know, uh, for um, developing into movies. I'm uh, Dr. Jose Victor Torres. I'm a uh, I'm an uh, associate uh, professor here at the uh, History Department of the uh, De La Salle University. I teach uh, Rizal and uh, Philin Philippine History here in the uh, History uh, Department. Well, I think it's because it's one of the closest places. If, if you're a foreign visitor, it's one of the closest uh, places and one of the most uh, visited based on tourism information it's one of the uh, most visited uh, places in uh, in the uh, manila well, because you have to remember manila is the capital city and uh, a capital city has to have its attraction both old and new and for so many years that old attraction and i don't mean old because it's passe you know, it's old because uh, it's part of our past and the realization that there was something that remained behind for the people to know and experience and see with their uh, own eyes is probably something that's, uh, that's um, an experience, a good experience for visitors, both foreign and uh, local. I'd probably Siguro describe Intramuros as uh, rich. It's rich in heritage, it's rich in the, the Filipino identity, and it's very rich in our history and culture. And I think that uh, would fit the description not only before but today. And as I always said, whenever you walk through the streets of Intramuros, you are walking through. Philippine uh, history. Uh, Intramuros is important uh, because it is one uh, destination, no, tourist destination in the city of Manila. And of course, this is a historical city. It is a city within a city because uh, the schools are here, churches are here, um, institution agencies, uh, uh, of course the, you know, the, the big uh, churches here uh, who always you know, support the IA and uh, of course the training center uh, who are here, the hospitals uh, are within the city of uh, Intramuros. Uh, my wish for Intramuros is uh, orderly, uh, clean city, and uh, people should be in their perspective uh, places, like for instance, if hopefully uh, by uh, in a couple of months or three months from now, uh, the ISF will be relocated to an uh, to a uh, resettlement site in Cavite or in uh, Bulacan because we want them to be in their respective homes and of course uh, with that Intramuros will rise again uh, with this you know, movement of informal settlers we are not removing them from here because they are part of the community they work here, they, they can come, they can live here, but they have to go uh, to their respective uh, permanent homes uh, after resettlement. And of course, uh, I wish also that Intramuros will be uh, fully developed uh, in terms of uh, vacant, uh, no, vacant lot, property, uh, the owners uh, will have this plan to develop their property here in Intramuro so that there will be no blighted areas anymore around. My name is uh, Marietta V. Aliaga. I, I started working here in Intramuros in 1983 
and uh, this will be my 35th year in Intramuros Administration. As Chief of the Urban Planning, I am uh, responsible for the monitoring of uh, construction in and around Intramuros. Uh, we are also in charge of the processing of the Intramuros Development Clearance. Intramuros should, uh, should be cherished, uh, should be loved, and should be taken care of. Because Intramuros is historical, we are part of the history of the Philippines. Ang Intramuros sa akin ay mahalaga. Ito ay naniniwala ako. Ito lang ang Old Manila na siya ay nagpalago ng Metro Manila. Ito yung prime mover ng urbanization din ng Metro Manila. Kung wala yung Intramuros, wala yung Metro Manila. Kasi dito nagsimula yung malalaking eskwelahan, malalaking building, lahat ng opisina ng gobyerno. Ito lang ang ba, uh, lugar na may, may walled city o ciudad morada na tinatawag. Kaya nandito yung mahalagang building, tao, saka ano, dito lumago. Pero no 1920 hanggang 1930, lumalabas na rin hanggang 1900, lumalabas na mayamang pamilya para magtayo ng malalaking bilya kasi masikip na rin Intramuros, mainit. Kailangan mag-expand mga, mga eskwelahan, lumabas sa Intramuros. Tudad na ng USD, lumabas siya no 1927. Tapos yung mga iba pa, Ateneo de Manila, nasunog siya no 1932. Tapos lumabas din siya. Sana magpatuloy, tuloy-tuloy na maayos sa Intramuros. Pagdating ng present generation, maayos sa Intramuros na wala nang masyadong problema. Kasi sa ngayon may mga, may mga kakagipat pa rin problema. Nandiyan pa rin mga ibang informal settler na may narelocate na kami, yung may istansa. Siguro dadami pa ang turista sa atin kasi mabubuksan natin yung isa gitna. Tapos yung mga pavement, ayos. Tapos yung mga travel ng tao, foreigner ay mapapabilis kasi marami nagpapaliwanag. Sa ngayon, dumadami na. May bambike na, may e-trike, may kalesa na. Marami na nag-aano sa Intramuros kasi ngayon, eh, nag nagiging ano na to, parang tuwing may uh, Manila tour, laging Intramuros ang priority ng Department of Tourism Heritage. Ako nga pala si Mr. Reynaldo Cadiz, nagtatrabaho sa Intramuros ng almost uh, 40 years, from 1979 hanggang, nine, hanggang ngayon. Naging restoration project, uh, inspector din ako sa Intramuros kasi lahat ng mga ginagawang restoration, idinaanan ko from uh, stone cutting, tapos pagbuboho, proper document, do, bago siya gawin, babaklasin muna namin yung mga lumang bato, tapos papalitan namin, mga may crack na, papalitan namin ng bago. Minsan, nung early part ng resto, uh, documentation namin, naglalagay din kami ng mga number sa bato para maibalik namin yung structure sa dating ayos. Napaka-importante sa Muros kasi ito yung buka, ito yung ano natin eh. O, sa, sa buhay ko napakahalaga to kasi da, dahil sa Intramuros uh, na dito ako nagtabaw ng 40 years, eh, naging tanungan ako ng mga pangyayari dito na bagamat hindi ko inaabot iba, yung mga archaeology, tunnel na nahukay, mga art artifacts. Tinatanong ako, mga nahukay ng mass grave, halos lahat building na nirestore, kung ano ba yung mga dating opisina dito ng pre-war. Kasi nagbasa din ako ng mga libro na about sa archives namin. Tapos yung mga old photo, napakahusay ko mag-identify kasi kabisado ko yung old photo and then in new, yung pagkakaiba. during the Marcos uh, administration. This is uh, 
Marcos uh, had been interested in the uh, restoration of uh, Intramuros. Uh, she uh, uh, led at the restoration of uh, some of the gates of uh, Intramuros. Mrs. Marcos got uh, the engineering divisions of uh, the different uh, services of the uh, military. And, uh, there were lots of objections. I called the attention of President Marcos. So he asked me to draft uh, uh, a charter for Intramuros, which is what I did, and that is the Intramuros Administration uh, Charter. Uh, the greatest satisfaction I had was uh, the presence of a good team uh, headed by uh, Mrs. Esperanza Gatmontol and uh, in the early days uh, also Felix uh, Imperial uh, because uh, basically the three of us uh, were the ones who set the initial uh, directions of uh, the Intermoros administration. It's important because it's part of our history, part of our heritage, one of the few physical evidences uh, remaining of uh, the uh, Spanish period of Philippine history. I think uh, the major development uh, since uh, that time uh, was the proliferation of informal settlers. And uh, it seems to me that uh, the uh, proper uh, and humanitarian relocation of those informal settlers is uh, critical to the uh, future progress of the Congress. I'm uh, Jaime Laya. And uh, I think the uh, the direct. Uh, welcome everyone to the 31st episode of the Intramuros Learning Session. So this is Rancho Arcilia and this episode is brought to you by the Intramuros Administration and supported by the International Council on Monuments and Sites Philippines. And before we start, I'd like to read first some house rules. So for Zoom attendees, you may raise your questions by the Q&A button, and if you are viewing via Facebook, you may raise your questions in the comment section below. Only those who have successfully registered in Vidon Zoom will be eligible to get a certificate, and the feedback form will be emailed to you after the session. A certificate will be sent within a week. Note that this webinar is recorded, and the recording shall be made permanently available in IA social media channels. And most importantly, enjoy this webinar. Uh, today we're going to have today we're going to have a topic on World Heritage Sites 
and on the concept of the outstanding universal value. And we are pleased to present to you our speaker for today, Mr. Gabriel Victor Caballero of the International Council of Monuments and Sites. So Mr. Gabriel Caballero is a, land, is a landscape architect and an independent World Heritage Specialist. He has an MA in World Heritage Studies from, from the Brandenburg University of Technology, Cottbus, Santenberg, Germany, and a Bachelor in Landscape Architecture from the University of the Philippines, Dilimar. In 2017, the Philippine Association of Landscape Architects gave recognition to Mr. Caballero as a recipient of the Gantin Pala Vanguard Award for his contributions in the protection of natural and cultural heritage areas. He is currently involved in a key project in Singapore that is sensitively creating a new tourist destination set amidst the natural protected areas of the Central Catchment Nature Reserve. And, if I may add, he is currently the Communications Officer of the International Council of Monument, Monuments and Sites Philippines. And welcome, Mr. Caballero, and we look forward to your presentation. Um, thank you very much for that, Rancho. Uh, it's a great thing to be here in the learning talks of uh, Intramuros administration. So um, allow me to share my screen and uh, uh, do the presentation. One second. So for colleagues who are in the, in the Philippines, good afternoon to you. And for colleagues who are in Europe or the um, Arab states, uh, uh, good evening. And for colleagues who are in the Pacific region and the Americas, um, uh, good morning to you. I would like to um, uh, present my uh, presentation today on cultural significance for world heritage sites and understanding the concept of outstanding universal value. So my discussion points will be covering uh, a couple of items. One is a background of the world heritage and uh, I will go to the definitions of outstanding universal value and proceed with the three pillars of OUV. Uh, that's the shorter version of outstanding universal value. That the world heritage criteria, authenticity and integrity and protection. And uh, the, I will go later on to the uh, role of world heritage sites for communities and how uh, as, as normal people, we can help protect and conserve not just world heritage sites, but heritage sites in general. So, oh, sorry. Uh, recently, uh, last uh, August, uh, I was invited by the Heritage Conservation Society to do a talk on um, a similar topic, but related to the significance, the cultural significance of sites. And I was happy to be part of this team with uh, uh, Miko Manalo, uh, Armin uh, Bulao, uh, Kathleen Tontrico, and uh, uh, Mark Evidente of the HES. And we've also um, provided some information on what it is to be having sites of cultural significance. I believe some of the um, participants of that um, webinar was also there, so uh, nice to have you here. So when you think about World Heritage Sites, right, you think about, uh, and you close your eyes, you think about the jewels of the world, the best of the best of heritage in the world. Most of the time when we think about Europe, we think about you know, the Eiffel Tower or Paris, uh, and that has been uh, stuck to many people's minds. Uh, when we think about Asia or world heritage in Asia, the Great Wall of China is something that appears. And if you think about natural sites, uh, you, we think about the, the Great Barrier Reef or something similar to that. And uh, this other picture of the Galapagos is the place of uh, where Charles Darwin created his theories of evolution is something that is part of the, the, our consciousness. But um, when you think about it, uh, the World Heritage Sites was not about all about this grandeur and, and sites like this. It has now become a brand, a brand of national narratives and international perspectives of values. Uh, this was not the case when it started out in the beginning. Now, um, I will share with you a little bit of a story of how it started out. Uh, first of all, uh, in 1959, UNESCO had a campaign in saving the site called Abu Simbel Temple in uh, Egypt. 
And uh, it was uh, uh, something was happening there. There was a dam that was being created, and it would flood this whole area. So uh, the states parties of UNESCO came together and say that we should help protect this this uh, very important site. And uh, eventually, in from 1964 to 1968, they managed to move the site to another location, and this became one of the first World Heritage Sites. By 1972, the state parties of UNESCO decided that they need to have a convention concerning the protection of world cultural and natural heritage. So this is the first time that it became uh, people see heritage in both lenses as both cultural and natural heritage as one thing. Um, after 20 years, uh, and, and uh, the, the, there are many sites that have been part of the world heritage, uh, in 1992, there was also a recognition of the idea of cultural landscapes, the combined works of nature and man. It's not just about the monumental sites, it's now about the landscapes. Um, uh, fortunately, uh, one of the first sites that was recognized as a cultural landscape is the rice terraces of the Philippines. And our um, beloved colleague, uh, Gusto Villalon, was one of the per first persons to advocate this. Um, with the popularity of uh, World Heritage Sites, in 2005, there was a question that came out, what can be done so that the sites in the World Heritage can be more balanced, more credible, and more representative of the world? Uh, a lot of times uh, before this, uh, if you think about Europe, you have a lot of heritage sites that have been nominated there and then part of world heritage, most of the places that we know of are world heritage in, in Europe. But there was a need to share the story of other places in Africa, in the Latin America region. And this was the starting point of that global strategy for a credible world heritage list. In 2011, uh, UNESCO provided a recommendation called the Historic Urban Landscape, which believes and advocates that cities are not just very, very static places. They are evolving, they are changing, they are like an amoeba that needs to look at both the perspectives of development but, and also heritage and how do you put it all together. It is a, a place that is always alive and cities are always alive when we go to the future. So um, the, in, the, in 1972, the word outstanding universal value actually just uh, was not very, very much present. It only came out in the preamble of the World Heritage Convention. So in the preamble, there are three parts that it uh, somehow says this. Uh, these are the three parts. In paragraph six of the preamble, it says something about a cultural and natural heritage of outstanding interest that needs to be preserved. The second time that it came out is the paragraph eight, which is about cultural and natural heritage of outstanding universal value that needs collective assistance. Okay, And the third one is uh, cultural and natural heritage of outstanding universal value that needs uh, effective systems of protection. Over the years, this terminology, outstanding universal value, was further enhanced and developed until 2005, the operational guidelines of the World Heritage has already solidified its perspective, which is the outstanding universal value means cultural and or natural significance, which is so exceptional as to transcend national boundaries and to be of common importance for present and future generations for all of humanity. As such, the permanent protection of this heritage is of the highest importance to the international community as a whole. What that means is that these sites in the World Heritage List is so great of an importance that it transcends any national importance. It goes beyond that and becomes part of a the international narrative that we want to pass on for our future generations, for all of humanity. So this is now the value of World Heritage Sites. So in the protection, uh, if you think about laws and you think about how these sites are protected, what is advised by the operational guidelines is that it is World Heritage is the utmost uh, 
sites of protection. Uh, unfortunately, the local sites, if they're not national sites of significance, they cannot be world heritage. They need to be recognized by the national bodies that they are of world significance. And uh, our laws and many, many other countries have these kinds of laws. Some of these laws will be considered as like um, um, for other kinds of uh, designation, like what you see here, Asia, ASEAN heritage parks, Ramsar sites for, for wetlands and biosphere reserves. They're equally important sites, uh, but, uh, and, and they're also covered by the UNESCO in a different kind of format. So don't worry if sites that you have are not necessarily world heritage sites, they can be in other designations as well. Uh, the outstanding universal value has, has three pillars. The first one is the property meets one or more heritage criteria. There are 10 world heritage criteria. The second pillar is about the property meeting the con uh, conditions of integrity and authenticity. This one I will share a little bit more later, what is integrity and authenticity. And the third is that the property meets the requirement for protection and management. This is what I was saying earlier about the laws and management systems. So I will go through this in, in more detail later on, but I will mainly focus first on the World Heritage Criteria. So the World Heritage Criteria, there are 10 criteria in the World Heritage List. Six are for cultural heritage criteria, and four are for natural heritage. The next few slides, I will be taking you through different parts of the world, uh, places that you might already know, um, that places that I some some of them I've been to, some of them I want to go to, or places that I have professional professional relationships or uh, had work on, or some of them are very very interesting sites to me. So, uh, but these are not um, uh, just the, it's only a handful of the, the the in the list. There are a thousand plus sites in the list, and. Um, I will not be able to know all of them, but uh, I will just give you how people see them and how they are worded in the World Heritage Convention. So the first one, the first criteria of World Heritage is masterpiece creations. It represents a masterpiece of human creative genius. So those masterpieces that are in the, this criteria are the perfect examples of beauty, of imagination, of creative works, of the, the best works of uh, renowned architects like Le Corbusier or Oscar Niemeyer, of great civilizations like Angkor Wat, the Forbidden City, the Vatican City, Gorbodur, and Kremlin and Red Square are having this Criterion One uh, masterpiece creation. The Sydney Opera House that was uh, inscribed in the World Heritage List in 2007 is said to have comprising of three groups of interlocking vaulted shells roofs uh, that has two main performance halls and a restaurant. Under Criterion 1, uh, it says that it represents multiple strands of creativity, both in architectural form and structural design, and a great urban sculpture carefully set in remarkable waterscapes in a world-famous iconic building. Now, this site has, uh, was uh, built for, uh, it took them 14 years to build and it is considered as one of the most over-budgeted buildings in the 21st century. Uh, the original cost of the building was estimated to be 7 million, but it eventually uh, became 102 million. Imagine 14 years to build and 102 million. I think it was very, very expensive. And it was funded by the state lottery. Uh, another example, oops, sorry. Another example of um, a site in Criterion 1 of masterpiece creations is the Taj Mahal in Agra, India, which was inscribed in 1983 in the World Heritage uh, Convention. The, the uh, Taj Mahal is, um, was built in 19, uh, 1631 to 1648 by the order of Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan in memory of his favorite wife, Mumtaz Mahal. Criterion 1 states that it is the finest architectural and artistic achievement through perfect harmony and excellent craftsmanship in a whole range of Indo-Islamic sepulchral architecture. That means it's a, it's a mausoleum uh, for, for uh, Mumtaz Mahal. 
It's a unique aesthetic, uh, aesthetic qualities in balance, symmetry, and harmonious blending of various uh, elements. Uh, so it is very, very symmetrical, and it is a, represent, a very good representation of one kind of architectural expression in the uh, Indo-Islamic uh, sepulchral architecture. Uh, criterion two in the next slide is uh, referring to uh, the in, to exhibit an important interchange of human values over a span of time or within cultural area of the world or in developments in architecture or technology, monumental arts, town planning, or landscape design. So as in comparison to the first criteria, this is about the interchange of values over time. It has uh, uh, things that have developed over a couple of years, not just years, but very, very long decades. Uh, it's not necessarily the most beautiful, but it shows continuity of the, its existence. Old towns like the, the city of Vienna, the historic center of Macau, Florence, Venice, and Georgetown in Malaysia are one of the examples of this kind of criteria. Now, this site, the Singapore Botanic Gardens, is very dear to my heart. I was uh, I reviewed it, and it was part of my uh, very, very detailed research a couple of years ago in 2013. And uh, it was inscribed to the World Heritage in 2015, and it's uh, meant to be a British tropical colonial botanic garden. Under Criterion 2, it is uh, said to be the center for plant research in Southeast Asia since um, plant research in Southeast Asia in the 19th century contributing to the significantly, uh, ex ex significant expansion of plantations in rubber in the 20th century. So this is, this is a picture of that um, rubber um, that is being investigated by Henry Ridley in um, during 1888 and then now uh, there's no not much of the rubber that is happening in the botanic gardens but that has spread throughout the asian region um, and th that is still something that is going on up to now so the story is that continuity of that the, the line of uh, technology and science between behind the rubber industry um, a, a local example is the Baroque churches of the Philippines. So as you uh, probably all know, there are four churches of the Baroque churches of the Philippines, the San Agustin Church in Manila, the Santa Maria Church in Ilocos Sur, Pauay Church in Ilocos Norte, and what we have here is the Miyagao Church in Iloilo. So uh, this is uh, under, inscribed under Criterion 2 as an established style of buildings and design that was adapted to the physical conditions of the Philippines. Built by the Spanish in the 16th century, it was a reinterpretation of what he called a Baroque style. Uh, by the China, it is a repeated, uh, reinterpreted by Chinese and Philippine craftsmen. Now, Baroque style is all about the grandeur and ab about very, very big gestures. But of course, when you think about the European settings, they will not have these kinds of very tropical plants. Uh, and, and what you see in the facade of the Miyagao church. So this is a completely good interpretation that we had in the Philippines that was taken from a Spanish uh, style and reinterpreted in the Philippine center. The third uh, type of um, uh, um, criteria is testimony, which is to bear a unique or at least exceptional testimony to a cultural tradition or to a civilization which is living or which has disappeared. So testimony means that there is a link to the past, that uh, past traditions and civilizations, many archeological sites uh, are found in this criteria, like this place, Shobe Cave or Lasco Cave, and a lot of uh, ruins are also inscribed under this criteria, like the Alhambra in Spain and the Parthenon in Greece, which was my cover photo earlier. Now, Grotte Chauvet Pont d'Arc is uh, a site that was inscribed uh, in 2014, which is uh, the earliest known and best preserved figuratively drawn uh, drawing in the world uh, by dating back as early as the origination period of 30,000 to 32,000 BC, making it the, an exceptional testimony to prehistoric art. So these are... Um, um, Things that were designed by, by or like crafted or like drawn by Neanderthals or early um, Homo sapiens, 
and uh, they have been there for well a very very long time until they were uh, recently discovered. Now uh, they're also uh, uh, what has happened to the site, and I've been to this area that uh, they now have closed the the cave and then have uh, created a new site wherein people can um, see these uh, marvelous um, crafted uh, paintings by uh, by early humans. Uh, this photo is no longer possible to do because it's it's uh, closed off. Uh, the next site that I'm having uh, uh, showing here is a place in Bahrain. It's called the Perling, Testimony of an Island Economy in Muharraq City in Bahrain. Now, if you see this site, you, you, you might wonder, what is it, right? So this site is actually looking at a purling, um, uh, like a system of living, right? It was, uh, it's con consists of 17 buildings in the Muharraq city, three offshore oyster beds, part of the seashore, and the Kalhat Bu Mahir fortress of the Muharraq city. It is, uh, represents a cultural tradition of pearling and the wealth it generated at the time when the trade dominated the Gulf economy from the second century to the 1930s, um, when unfortunately Japan was the developed uh, the, the cultural pearls. Uh, there was a traditional use of the sea's resources in this area and human interaction to the environment which shaped the, the economy and the cultural identity of the place. So testimony is always about you know the testament of a particular living or dead um, cultural uh, civilization. Okay, so this again is one of those question marks, right? So what is in this, this site? So this is called the Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands that was inscribed in 2010. Uh, uh, criteria four is about typology or stages in history. So that is to be an outstanding example of a type of building, architectural or technological ensemble or landscape which illustr illustrates a significant stage in human history. So this is about focusing a time in history. Now the Bikini Atoll, even though this picture is quite deceiving, was also a site of the United States um, decision to do nuclear testing in the Pacific region. Uh, uh, the Bikini Atoll was selected um, in the Marshall Islands and 67 nuclear test sites, uh, tests rather, were carried out from 1946 to 1958 including the explosion of the first H-bomb in 1952. Criterion 4 has uh, indicated this is an outstanding example of a nuclear test site uh, and a testimony to the birth of the Cold War, and it bears testimony to the race to develop increasingly powerful nuclear weapons. It bears witness to the consequences of the nuclear test on the civil population, the population of the displacement, and public health issues. So. The World Heritage doesn't only tell about the story of beautiful things. It also tells a story of these kinds of sites that have very, very meaningful um, stories to tell, even though you know, Marshall Islands is not so accessible. And this site is really uh, a place that is, uh, let's say, a bad story in history. Um, the other example, the Philippine example, of a typology or stage in history is the historic town of Vigan which was inscribed in the World Heritage List in 1999. It's uh, said to be the best example of a planned Spanish colonial town in Asia, and it reflects the coming together of cultural elements from elsewhere in the Philippines, from China from and from Europe. So uh, at the time of the Galleon trades, you know, Vegan was a center of trade because uh, it com it's very near to the Chinese area, uh, well, from chi China, and then at the, it was at the river delta of the Abra River. And uh, the Galleon, we were part of that Galleon trade. So that combination of different influences, um, uh, particularly the Spanish influence, was left here in this city. Uh, Criterion 4 says that Vegan is an exceptional, intact, and well-preserved example of a European trading town in East and Southeast Asia. So we have to also note that there are also other um, trading towns in Southeast Asia. Macau is an example of the Portuguese. Uh, town, uh, which is also inscribed in the World Heritage List, 
and Georgetown is an example of a British uh, uh, trading town in Southeast Asia. Okay, this one is uh, a little bit deceiving. It is uh, uh, it's a traditional land use. So Criterion 5 is about an outstanding example of a traditional human settlement of land use or sea use, which is represented of a culture or cultures of human interaction with the environment, especially when it has become vulnerable under the impact of irreversible change. So the key word here is traditional land use and the interaction of the of the environment and human settlements. So if uh, some of you are aware, uh, I mentioned earlier about this term cultural landscape, many of the cultural landscapes that is the interaction of human and, and, uh, and the environment is actually under this uh, category or criteria. The, um, some examples in the World Heritage List are the following. So the coffee cultural landscape in Colombia, the tequila, tequila landscape of Agaves in Mexico, uh, you know, when you hear Burgundy, that's also a place in France, Prosecco in Italy, and another place called the Rhine Valley in Germany are under all this Criterion 5. Now, this picture that we I sh show here is called the Sacred Mijikenda Kaya Forest at the coastal province of Kenya, and it was inscribed in 2008. Now, the Mijikenda Kaya Forest consists of 10 separate forest sites spread over some 200 kilometers of the coast containing the remains of numerous fortified villages, best known as Kayas. You know, this is part of a, a, a small fortified village that is, um, uh, they're a little bit, um, they're not in the picture, but they're there. Now, th these Kayas were created at the 16th century, but ab uh, abandoned in the 1940s, and are now regarded as the abodes of ancestors. So the Mijikenda people have moved out of this area. But what they've done is that once they left, they have designated this uh, Kaya forest as a protected site of their ancestors. So what that has done is that it has improved the quality of the forest. No one uh, or very, very little people actually tried to dog these areas. And they're considered sacred. And uh, under Criterion 5, because of the spiritual, uh, the spiritual nature of this place, it has become uh, in, um, inscribed and restrictions were placed for the actual access and utilization of natural uh, forest resources. The biodiversity of the Kayas and the forest surrounding them has been sustained. But unfortunately, because the, the, the Mijikenda have, smooth, have moved out of the, uh, these uh, places, traditional knowledge is also being lost. So now there's also a balance of how do you keep traditions alive in cultural landscapes and traditional land use areas. I think that's something that we can talk about. Uh, another example that is in the Philippines is the rest terraces of the Philippine Cordilleras. So it was inscribed in 1995. And um, let me just point out a little bit of something that it, when I say it's under Criterion 5, there's also, uh, sometimes they're also inscribed, inscribed in other uh, criteria, which they also fit in those criteria. So I, I just want to focus this one about settlement and land use. So the rice terraces of the Philippines, there are five areas, the Batad, the Bangan, Mayoyao, Ugduan, and Nagahadan rice terraces are part of the official World Heritage Site. It is the fruit of knowledge uh, uh, handed down from one generation to the next and expressions of sacred tradition and the delicate social balance. Under Criterion 5, it is uh, a bit, an outstanding example of land use that resulted from harmonious interaction between people and the environment, uh, which produced this terraced uh, landscape of great aesthetic beauty. What um, people don't know much about is that um, the reason why this is quite sustainable is because most of the forests on top of the, the mountains have traditionally been kept as forests so that once it rains, it doesn't run off uh, too much to the terraces and create like massive floods. And uh, the irrigation system that was developed here is um, taking into account all these different uh, conditions of the site and uh, the, the mountains and uh, the, the use of uh, irrigation for um, food production. Now, I will go to uh, um, a site uh, um, but that 
some of you may, might be aware of. Uh, this is a criterion six, which is about associations, ideas, and beliefs, which states that it is directly or tang tangibly associated with events or living traditions with, ide with ideas or be with beliefs, with artistic and literary works of outstanding universal significance. Now, associations, um, uh, this criteria is not so much used by itself uh, for World Heritage because a lot of places have, well, almost all places have associations and ideas and beliefs behind them. But um, uh, places like Mount Fuji and in Japan, you know, when you think about Japan and the beautiful landscape, you think about taking a photo of Mount Fuji. It is in, in literature and a, a lot of uh, pictures of Japan. Uh, Mount Athos in, in Greece is the holy mountain of the Greek Orthodox Church. And um, they imagine it as their, their piece of heaven. Kathmandu Valley in Nepal is also the same thing for Buddhists and Hindus alike. Now, the story that I'm about to tell, tell is not a good one, but it is an important story to tell as well. The Auschwitz-Birkenau is, is the German Nazi concentration and extermination camp of 1940 to 1945. It is the largest in the Third Reich of uh, extermination camps. It makes me very uh, 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 difficult. Um, there were uh, 1.5 million who were, uh, who were um, exterminated here. And it was uh, the symbol of humanity's cruelty to the fellow human beings in the 20th century. Okay. Sorry, I'm a little bit, um, I, I've been to the site, that's why I'm a little bit um, um, affected by it. But um, it is a powerful symbol, really, that um, monuments of genocide should not be um, should be kept as a reminder that it should not happen. Yeah. So um, they were interestingly um, uh, nominated at, at early at an early stage of uh, the World Heritage Convention in 1979, and it, it is also a, a story of uh, the triumph of the human spirit that um, ad, uh, through adversity people can. Uh, make the better out of themselves. So, okay, so a little bit uh, clear idea. Okay, the next one is another um, not so nice story, but it is also quite important, which is the cultural landscape of um, and archaeological remains of the Mamian uh, Valley. So this this place is um, what is quite significant here is this hole that is empty. Now this is a place in Afghanistan that was inscribed in 2003 because the people united and wanted to have this site nominated because um, there was a Buddha that was there and uh, the Taliban actually blew it up. Um, this is um, an example of that and uh, there's a picture of that. And um, it was a, a place of artistic and religious uh, development, uh, which from the first to the 13th centuries characterized the Bactria, um, ancient Bactria, sorry, integrating various cultural influences of the Gandhara School of Buddhist Art. Now, um, in 2001, um, this is the thing that happened, which is the Taliban um, blew it up. And of course, um, it is a not, not a nice story to tell, but it was the, the thing that's made people you know, think about nominating this site. Um, in Criterion 6, it is uh, uh, seen to be the most monumental expression of the Western Buddhism the center of pilgrimage over many centuries. And this monument have, um, due to their symbolic values, the monument have suffered different um, uh, uh, demolitions or like uh, effects over time, which included the deliberate destruction in, 19, in 2001, which shook the whole world. Okay, so after the six criteria are the four natural criteria, a little bit happier this time. So the number seven, uh, the seventh criteria is superlative phenomenon or beauty. So it is saying that it contains a superlative natural phenomenon or areas of exceptional natural beauty and aesthetics or import, uh, uh, aesthetic importance. So similar to the first criteria of cultural heritage sites, this is the same kind of thing, but of natural beauty or natural phenomenon. Now, I, I mentioned earlier the Great Barrier, site, uh, Great Barrier Reef in Australia. Excuse me. The the Swiss Alps in Switzerland that is very very iconic. Uh, people know it all. The Yellowstone National Park is also part of this um, uh, criteria. 
Now, the picture that we see here is the Ngoro Ngoro Conservation Area, which is in Tanzania that was inscribed in 1979. Uh, the Ngoro Ngoro uh, conservation is a vast expanse of highlands, plains, savannas, and savanna woodlands and forests, which, uh, with wildlife coexisting with semi-nomadic Maasai pastoralists practicing traditional livestock grazing. So the Maasai are those people that you know you've seen in videos that they like to jump and they have like red reddish hair. Um, it is also the site of an annual migration of wildebeest, zebras, gazelles, and other animals in the northern plains. So in, in Criterion 7, it is really this kind of a stunning landscape of the Ngoro Ngoro crater. It's a large crater. It's the largest crater in the world, combined with the concentration in wildlife that is um, meant, uh, that is inscribing it to the World Heritage List. The, the spectacular movement of wildebeests, over a million animals uh, every year, is uh, what people uh, um, um, come here for. Um, and in Criterion 7, we also have our own Puerto Princesa subterranean river, which was inscribed in the World Heritage List in 1999. Uh, this park is a spectacular limestone karst landscape with an underground river. Now, uh, it has emerged directly into the sea, and its lower portion is subject to tidal influences. And it is a full, considered as a full mountain to sea ecosystem. What is the most important part of this um, World Heritage Site with, under the, the Criterion 7 is that it is a very long uh, underground river that has uh, connects the river to the sea. So it's not, uh, I think uh, what it said is that this is the only underground river that connects the river to the sea. As, uh, and it is, uh, that is the superlative phenomenon. Um, the, the, uh, it is associated with tidal influence of the river, makes this as an, also as an, uh, uh, a natural phenomenon. So I've been to the site. It's a very nice site. You can go to parts of it, but unfortunately, you cannot go to the sea. Uh, I think that's uh, it's also very important because of the tides that can can uh, be affected by this uh, uh, underground river. Now, um, criterion eight is about geological processes. So, uh, as is described, it is an outstanding example representing major stages of the Earth's history, including the record of life significant ongoing geological processes in the development of landforms, significant geomorphic or physiographic features. So um, if you think about very, very amazing uh, geological places or geological processes, most of the sites that are here are from there. So um, Jeju Island, for example, it's a volcanic island in Korea. Halong Bay, if you've been there, it's also a very, very spectacular geological formation. And um, the Uluru Kata Chuja, which is the Ayer Rock in northern Australia. You know, it's this big red rock that you see in uh, when you imagine Australian outback. So um, the this place, uh, which I've been to as well in Australia, is uh, called Fraser Island, which was inscribed in 1992 in the World Heritage List. It is a 122-kilometer-long, large, largest sand island in the world. Now, it's uh, the world's um, uh, perched freshwater dunes and lakes are found inland and the beach. So, basically, this whole island is all about the sand. But you can see that uh, different kinds of ecosystems have also uh, grown here. Now, it is under the criterion um, eight, it is inscribed as a significant ongoing geological processes, including longshore drift, the longest and most complete age sequence of coastal dune systems in the world, and it's still evolving. So this landscape is always changing because the, the, the sand keeps changing as well. Okay, another example of uh, in criterion eight is this place in Dorset and East Devon Coast in the U United Kingdom. Uh, it was inscribed in 2001. Now, this is um, uh, an interesting site because uh, it is almost it is uh, said to be the almost continuous sequence of rock formations spanning the Mesozoic era for some 185 million years. It is almost a continuous sequence of Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous rock formations. And um, it tells you know, the, 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 a very long story of the Earth's history. 
it is also uh, globally significant in terms of uh, fossil localities, both the vertebrate and invertebrate, and marine and terrestrial fossils. Um, it's, a, it's a site of education as well, because geology and paleontology and geomorphology are you know, uh, things that can be taught here. The interesting thing about this site is that if you walk down this coast where people are, uh, chances are that you will actually see fossils, small ones, maybe shells or maybe bigger ones as well. And that is part of the things that they actually need to manage in this site because, well, there really are a lot of fossils. Um, we're now at the criterion nine. So criterion nine is about e ecological and biological processes. So it's said to be um, described as outstanding examples representing significant ongoing ecological and biological processes in the evolution and development of terrestrial freshwater, coastal, and marine ecosystems and communities of plants and animals. So the key word is, it is about the ecological and biological processes. When I bring back the Galapagos Island that I showed earlier, so this is about the ecological processes of you know, evolution, right? Um, this place called Phong Nha Ke Bang is uh, uh, in Vietnam, which has the largest, one of the largest um, uh, caves in, in Southeast Asia. Is also um, a, a type of biological process, which I will explain a little bit more about this Mulu cave. Um, the primeval beech forest in Carpathia is located in 12 countries in Europe, which is um, showing the, the, the type of forests that were found in, from the Ice Age, and they're still located in Europe. Now, this picture that we have here uh, is a place that I've been to several times is uh, Gunung Mulu National Park, which was inscribed in 2000 uh, in the World Heritage List. It is in Malaysia, and it's in, uh, in um, Sarawak. Now, this is a place that is most studied, a most studied tropical karst area in the world. It, it's uh, a 52,000 hectare park, which contains 17 vegetation zones, exhibiting 3,500 species of vascular plants. Now, the, the interesting thing about this, under criteria nine, is that it's, it's cave fauna with two, over 200 species recorded, and they, including many troglobitic species, means that troglobitic is only found living inside the cave. They don't go out. They just, they just live there. Um, and it is an ongoing ecological and uh, showing an e ongoing ecological and biological process. So what you see here, um, is there, there's the forest outside, and all this is a collapse. But all these areas here, they look like mud, but they're actually what you call as guano, which is the bat droppings. So the bat droppings are the thing that makes the, the ecosystem alive. There are a lot of the invertebrates here uh, that only depend on the bat droppings. The, the, um, the, uh, uh, bats would go out at night, and they would just come back and, you know, um, do their thing, just like any, any other day. Um, okay, the next one is, uh, for Criterion 9, is Tubataha Reef National Park, which is also in the Philippines, in Palawan. It was inscribed in the, in the World Heritage List in 1993, and it refers to a unique example of an atoll reef with very high density of marine species. It is also one of the Philippines' oldest ecosystems and plays a key role in the process of reproduction and dispersal and colonization of marine or organisms in the whole Sudu system. It is an ongoing process of coral reef formation. So the key word is they are saying it's an ongoing process of coral reef formation that is inscribing this uh, site uh, and supporting a large number of marine species dependent on the coral reefs. The presence of top predators species, such as the tiger and hammerhead shark, indicates that it's a healthy environment. Um, uh, the, oh, sorry, the last one. So the last criteria is about di biodiversity and habitats. So under criterion 10, it says that it contains the most important or significant natural habitats for in-situ conservation of biological diversity, including those containing threatened species of outstanding universal value from the point of view of science of, or conservation. So the key thing is about biodiversity. These are places that have a threatened species or uh, very, very biodiverse um, um, places. 
Um, one example aside from this is the Wood Buffalo National Park in Canada, which has the wild bisons, and the, the Virunga National Park in the same country as Democratic Republic of Congo, which has the gorillas. If you've seen the um, uh, Netflix Virunga, uh, you should watch it. it. It actually tells about this World Heritage Site, Virunga National Park. Now, the Okapi Wildlife Reserve in the Democratic Republic of Congo was inscribed in the World Heritage List in 1996, and it, it occupies about one-fifth of the Ituri Forest. It's, the Ituri Forest is a large forest in the eastern side of Congo. Um, it, is, uh, it contains about 6,000 of the estimated 30,000 okapis in the wild. And the reserve is inhabited by tradition, traditional nomadic pygmy, mabuti, and effi hunters. So these, these people are, when we when say pygmy, uh, mabuti, they're like a little bit shorter people, and they live inside the forest. Uh, criterion 10 uh, identifies that this is a place of biogeographical wealth and presence of numerous species that are rare or absent in the adjacent low altitude forest. And of course, um, the okapi, this, this, this animal, which looks like a, a, a um, horse, is actually a part of the giraffe family. Uh, and it has some sore horns and it has a, like stripes like a zebra, but it is not, it is, it is a, a, a giraffe family. So it is also uh, the home of endemic species of giant cycads. There are 101 animal uh, mammal species here and 376 species of birds. And uh, 17 primates that are the highest number in an African forest. Okay, the last one we, uh, of the uh, examples that I will share is something that is dear to my heart as well. It is Mount Hamigitan Range Wildlife Sanctuary, sanctuary in, um, in the um, Davao in uh, which was inscribed in 2014. Uh, why it was dear to me is that it is, um, uh, I was there in the World Heritage Committee meeting in Bahrain when it happened. And I, I, uh, I was actually part of the people, uh, I was under IUCN at the time and it, we, we celebrated uh, that kind of a uh, new achievement for the Philippines as uh, the last nominated property was uh, well, in the 1990s and this was in 2014. So it's, it's our sixth World Heritage Site in, in the Philippines. And uh, in the description, it, uh, it's said to be including threatened and endemic flora and fauna, and eight of which are only found in Mount Amigitan. Uh, they, they have also critically endangered trees and plants of iconic and iconic Philippine eagle and Philippine cockatoo. So um, uh, this is the range of the, um, the Philippine eagle. Now, it is, uh, what is also interesting in this site is that they have what you call as a, a fragile tropical bonsai forest on top. So the, the bonsai forest is a type of forest that is miniaturized because of the height uh, where it is at. Yeah, and it, it is substantially intact and high di highly diverse mountain ecosystem. So th those are the 10 criteria. And I, I will, uh, this one I'll go quite quickly. Uh, to, to our, uh, so that we can go to Q&A soon. But the, the second pillar of um, outstanding universal value is authenticity and integrity. So when you think about authenticity, it just asks this question, does it tell the, the story truthfully? Now, I have a picture here of Vegan and also of Akuzar, right? So Akuzar definitely is a, we all know, it's a man-made area, places, uh, um, heritage sites or heritage buildings were put together to create that kind of very uh, atmospheric site. But uh, it is not original. It is not, uh, uh, to say, authentic uh, as a setting. Now, vegan is still an authentic setting. So um, authenticity is defined. If you look at this uh, diagram that I have, it is just showing that if, let's say, a site is representing pink, you know, if it's about a pink, all the pinks in the world, then you have to have a site that encompasses all the pinks. But if it, you want to tell the story of the pink, blue, and green, and yellow, then you have to also say that it's all about the different colors, or different types of sites. Now, um, let's say also, let's say San Sebastian is one of those, the only type of um, steel structure of um, um, church in the Philippines. 
its authenticity comes from saying that it is the only um, uh, steel structure church in the Philippines. That is about its authenticity. Now, um, um, I will not go through this in very detail, but uh, there is a manual that provides questions of how you can define the authenticity. It's about the form and design, materials and substance, use and function, traditions and techniques, location setting, intangible heritage, and spirit and feeding. And this is why I was saying that the location and setting for Akusar is, 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 is taken out of the, the context. Now, uh, the other part is integrity. So integrity is about the completeness. Does it tell the whole story of a site? Um, when you look at these the diagram, let's say uh, when you describe a site, is it just these three areas? Uh, and maybe the site just needs to be in this very, very small area. But if there are other areas that are also of the same quality, you also have to tell that story because it will not be complete if the story is not told if the, the other parts are not there. So it includes all the necessary elements and it does not suffer from neglect and it has ad adequate size. So these four pictures are the four uh, Baroque churches in the Philippines. So they should be seen together. They're a family of sites. And um, if you remove one of them, then the story is not the same kind of story, right? There is a, there is a move now to have um, increasing the amount of Baroque churches in the Philippines and that is also in, as, uh, in, the, in the works for the UNESCO tentative list for the Philippines. Uh, the last uh, um, pillar of uh, outstanding universal value is the management, you know, what is needed to assure its future. So when you, when you think about that, this is about protection measures, these are about the compliance to the laws and the management systems and practices that are in there. Now, uh, for heritage practitioners in the Philippines, it is about the CMP, and for other places, it's called the um, Heritage Management Plan, but it can also be traditional systems of management. So let's say in, uh, in the Ifugao region, they have kinds of systems that are inbuilt in, the, in their intangible uh, uh, heritage, and that is also considered as a management strategy. I've put this back here because it, it just says that the management system has to be in so that it can be a world heritage site. Right? It can be the most beautiful place in the world that has, is authentic and has integrity, but without a management plan, a management system, it will actually not be a world heritage site. So um, um, in, uh, this, uh, we're going to um, the later parts of this presentation. And I just wanted to highlight that as part of the review for world heritage, it's a need for a global comparison of sites. So if you look at the picture, and you, this might be familiar to you, which is, I've, I've said it earlier, is the, the um, rice terraces of the Philippines. But the two other pictures are not from the Philippines. They are also World Heritage sites. One is the cultural landscape of the Hani rice terraces in China. And it's also inscribed in the World Heritage List. And the, the third one is in Bali the cultural landscape of Bali province, the Subak system, and the manifestation of the tree, Kita Kana philosophy. So they might look the same, but they have different stories to, sell, to tell, rather. Um, the the um, cultural landscape of the Hani rice terraces um, plants a type of rice that is red. So when you see this picture here, the look and feel is totally different. And they have, um, you know, the, the ducks also fertilize the, 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 um, um, the plants, they, the young rice plants. They have chickens there as well, the pigs, and providing fertilizer and more mature plants with a water buffalo also plowing the field. Some of these are uh, similar to the story that we told in the Philippines, but it has a slightly different story to tell. And that, it, that is fine. You, you need to craft that story that is unique to that place. Well, Bali has uh, the Subak system, which is a type of um, irrigation system that is related to the Trihita Kana philosophy, that is related to the, uh, the, 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 the spirits. So they, they, they have packaged this kind of site that they say that it is related to the spirits. Okay, um, in, in World Heritage, if you will ask me later on how it all happens, so it comes together first to the tentative list of UNESCO Philippines. And this is now the 19 sites in the list. Uh, you can go to the UNESCO uh, World Heritage Center website to see what are in the list. 
Uh, and then all these tentative sites are um, evaluated by the advisory bodies of the of the uh, convention, which is ECOMOS, IUCN, and ECROM. Uh, ECOMOS is mostly for the cultural sites, and IUCN is for natural sites, but the, it is a collaborative process for some sites, particularly mixed sites or cultural landscapes. Now, afterwards, the recommendation goes to what we call as the UNESCO World Heritage Committee. The committee is composed of 21 states, excuse me, the, the 21 states that they do a round robin, that they, they are the ones who actually provide uh, the approval of it, if a site goes in or not. So it's not UNESCO it is uh, uh, that does the approval. It is this 21 states that says a, a country or a heritage site becomes a world heritage. Of course, there are recommendations from experts from ECOMOS and IUCN and ECROM that is provided for, before that decision to happen. Okay, we are now at the, the end of this conversation, but when, when I was discussing all this, you know, you might be asking to yourself, like, why, what does it all mean? What, why do we have to care about World Heritage Sites in, while in the pandemic and we can't go anywhere, you can't really travel, uh, and, you know, you're, where people are more worried of the food that they eat and, you know, it's very unsafe to travel. But as we can see, World Heritage Sites and people that are surrounding World Heritage Sites also matter. They, we all, they, people need to also eat in these areas and they also have to survive. So the role of World Heritage Sites, and I, I bracketed world here, is saying that uh, world is, um, uh, it can be heritage sites as well that uh, are um, important to communities. They are a source of livelihood, not just for tourism related industries, it is also, you know, your your postman who delivers your postcards to to the post, and you know, saying nice things to your family. It's about the, you know, uh, the food, uh, the the places of of, uh, of um, culture, and you know, even the 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 guy who sells the the isau in the street in one of the the heritage sites. Heritage sites are of livelihood to a lot of people. They are a point of destination, and um, uh, when you hear World Heritage Site, you want to go there, right? It is, uh, people are excited to go in these places. And for most places outside of the Philippines, and I hope it happens in the Philippines, it is a potential starting point for regeneration. It is also a source of pride for a lot of people, community spirit that drives action. Uh, when you heard of the, the, the fire of the Notre Dame, people gave money, you know, gave money to it, even though they, they're not from France because it is a source of pride or international pride for some. And uh, it, is, it creates distinctiveness and anchors identity. You know, when you have this very old house in your province or uh, uh, your heritage site, you always remember it and you, you anchor your, your sense of place to that site. Oh, it's near the two streets from my house is this site. And if it retains there, the sense of place is retained. Now it's an educational resource. For a lot of people, not just for students, it's a resource for researchers, uh, for, for peop normal people as well that uh, wants to learn about um, the, the culture and history. And of course, beautiful sites that are well protected are inspired. You know, people want to take their selfie moments to, to sites that are very, very nice. In my last page, I have only one page left and, um, oh, sorry, two pages left. And um, I just want to say that how can you help? and conserve sites of significance. So out, while in COVID, we cannot go to all the sites, but of course, we need to still patronize these sites, visit or buy or donate. You know, virtual tours are out there. there. There are people who are paid to do the virtual tours and, you know, it continues that kind of economy that is part of the, the thing. We're all here because of this conversation of, um, of, of a, a digital economy. Uh, we, um, when you learn about the site, you become a vessel of that significance. I've given you 20 sites in, in the World Heritage, and I become that vessel, and that I tell you that story, and I hope that you become a vessel of that story as well, and you can tell it that the significance is strengthened, strengthened because of knowing the, the stories. Um, you can also visit, when we, when we get out of this uh, pandemic, we can visit responsibly. You know, uh, when I say visit responsibly, when you do day tours, you can decide to go um, and patronize the site. You can stay overnight and stay in a place that is not so popular, but also provides authentic food. Because, because 
a lot of people depend on these sites. And we have to know that we also contribute to that. Even just not throwing your garbage in that area is already a contribution to the protection of, of the sites of significance. And volunteer, be a heritage advocate. For, for I, I know that some of our um, interns are here. ECOMOS Philippines provides internship programs. You can, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that we do have this kind of volunteerism uh, and had heritage advocacy uh, and many other heritage organizations do that. Um, uh, just one last uh, run choice. I, I know that I'm um, one hour now, but uh, um, for landscape architects like myself and others who are in the audience, there's also um, a place for us for uh, um, world heritage and heritage. If you know of sites that are uh, or landscape architect project, or pro projects that have a heritage component, do take that on, but do collaborate with heritage practitioners so that you don't mess it up. Yeah? Uh, use native soft cake materials in design. These are the plants and act, uh, advocate for sustainable propagation of plant species. Don't take from the forest. Uh, you know, they are natural heritage sites, but advocate for sustainable use of resources. Learn about traditional indigenous uh, hardscape materials or like uh, working materials or building methods. We can learn from them. We can take them on board for the future generation. And, you know, Escuela Talier does a great job in teaching people about this. Uh, go to the forest, learn more about the natural world, not just go to the urban areas, because once you discover that there is, a, you know, a biodiversity out there, then you will appreciate that it needs to be protected. And of course, last, last one is watch webinars like this, the conservation related for built and natural heritage. Get to know more things about heritage. There is an ECOMOS IFLA, uh, International Federation of Landscape Architects, scientific committee that comes uh, puts it all together. Uh, I think that's my last slide. So uh, if you want resources, these are very good resources. All that I said, uh, most of the things that I said is in the World Heritage Center. You can look at this uh, website and uh, uh, a lot of the um, arguments or questions, that, uh, uh, thoughts that I had are coming from these resources as well. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Gab, for that very interesting presentation. Now we are opening the floor to a short round of Q&A, and everyone is encouraged to ask their questions. If you are in Zoom, feel free to raise your questions in the Q&A button. And if you are in Facebook, viewing in Facebook, you can raise your questions in the comment section below. And uh, if you also have comments, why not? So you can also share your comments in the Q&A button or in the comment section of Facebook. Uh, a lot of people are asking about age. So it is brought up several times in Facebook and in Zoom. So let me consolidate all of those questions into a single question. So when is age a consideration? And what categories would you say, uh, among the 10 categories, uh, which ones would you say uh, where age is the most important uh, consideration because uh, there are certain heritage sites which are actually very young when they were declared. So, for example, maybe Brasilia yeah. established in 1960, but after less than 30 years was already declared a world heritage site. So, what categories do you think in the ten, among the 10 are where age is the most important? So, um, uh, good question. So, um, the criterion two is the most important of that, which is uh, describing the interchange of values over time. So, let's say um, places like, uh, well, actually vegan is also there, but the, the, the old towns of, that are very old, not necessarily uh, like the most beautiful, but they are very old. They can be part of the World Heritage List. Uh, because of their very um, uh, long tradition of uh, as an urban um, area. Yeah. Uh, so you mean to say that age is, uh, except for category two, age is not really the most important in general, no? No. So there are other considerations as well, aside from age. Correct. So the, the world the heritage, uh, it, it, you, you know, when you think about uh, world heritage it, uh, or heritage in general, there are different types of values. And uh, I, I brought it this, this up in my talk in HCS is there are mainly eight values that are out there, historical, scientific uh, values. There is uh, the, uh, the idea of ecological values. Um, so age is only one of the values that we have. And 
even industrial buildings are also in the World Heritage List. Uh, uh, as you said, Brasilia, even though it's young, it is also in that list. But for the Philippines, we have uh, some sort of cap of the definition of heritage is around 50 years old. And that is actually in the, in the law. But of course, that is still uh, uh, subject for interpretation. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. We have a comment from Tats Manahan. So just a comment regarding Notre Dame. A similar occurrence happened when Teatro de la Finis burned down in 1996. Among those who contributed for the restoration were the Venetian prostitutes. This is how knowledgeable and concerned people are in Italy and Europe in general. Yeah, so I, I think we should um, imbibe that, you know, that when we think about heritage uh, and we think, oh, you know, it's only a segment of people that think about it. But in fact, no, we have to see that if, let's say, um, a, a heritage site is in danger, a lot of people would, uh, uh, I hope, that uh, see it as a, a call for action. And we shouldn't do it at the last minute as well. But, uh, you know, the, in Brazil, the, you know, the library has, was burned as well. And that was a cause of a lot of pain and suffering for a lot of people. And imagine that if, if things are lost, there is a part of, of history or a part of yourself as a, as a person that is lost because it is no longer existing. We have uh, our next question is from Mylene Leasing. Thank you for that informative talk. Awesome. I have three sets of questions, please. So her, she said, when you say outstanding universal value, who defines outstanding universal and whose value system is values based on? Second, when we say we are preserving these sites for future generations, who are these future generations? How long into the future are we looking at? And how do we know that they would care about this? And lastly, is there value based on the relevance of these heritage sites to the current existing population who might be living in or using these sites and who might be affected by the declaration or inclusion in the World Heritage List. Thank you. Okay, so Mylene, you've given me a very tough job, but uh, I, will, I will answer your questions as best as I can. The, the value systems that are being placed on outstanding universal value, um, I, I have to tell you that these sites that go to the World Heritage List is actually combined together as the state party, which is the, the country. So it goes to different kinds of reviews and comes together as submitted. So once the state party, uh, and I call the state party because this is the UNESCO term for it, it the state party submits the, 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 the list, it becomes of their, the value system of that country, right? So outstanding universal value, it is the argument of the country to the World Heritage Committee, and the World Heritage Committee evaluates this kind of value and says, okay, yes, it is of outstanding universal value. Okay, second question, future generations. I, I, I attended a, a, a very, very provocative conversation on this in, in, in Amsterdam uh, by Cornelius Horto about heritage futures and whose futures are we thinking of. When you think about sustainable development, you also think about the, the future generation. And technically, we don't know the future generation. You know, you don't know the baby that will be developed in your tummy until it gets delivered, right? But there is a hope for, for uh, generations of today that they want to, to imbibe something for the future. So if the, the future generation, your, your future children or grandchildren see that, hmm, I don't really value this, but it is for them to decide. But for us, it is a question of what we want to impart for the future. It is all about our value systems now that we want to, to share. Okay, uh, last one is also related to values based on the current population. I think um, everyone is allowed to value different things. Well, you know, when we think about it, you know, I we value kind of a, uh, system or modernity or versus heritage. It's, it's the, the idea that we all um, need to care for something. And I hope that 
the caring of the past is also part of that. Um, some people they don't they don't really think about it, but it is us who are here, the 247 people, and much more in Facebook. We need to tell people, hey, heritage value is important to, to us. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Gab. Uh, how do you think uh, does inscription in the World Heritage List affect private ownership rights? Okay, uh, private ownership is not um, part of that. So, so uh, let's say a, a private uh, entity or a private uh, owner decides to um, have his site um, part of this list. It is still under his care, right? There are uh, there are rules and regulations to, to have that. Uh, when you think about vegan, right? So the vegan is a is a historic town, and of course the the, the town is owned by different owners, the the, the different plots. So uh, they can be in the list, but um, um, uh, uh, but there are guidelines that are created so that you protect it um, for, in in reference to what is required for World Heritage List. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, how do you think uh, can there be a balance between human access and the preservation of sites? Is there any set of standards for the uh, regarding uh, the issue of over visitation or too much human activities? Let's say, for example, for natural heritage sites. So okay, so um, for natural heritage sites, there are different types of protected areas. Um, I, 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 well, I, there are, I think, five of them. And then each one has a certain kind of, um, um, let's say, criteria for visitation or like perspective of. So let's say the most um, um, protected ones, or the, let's say the primary forests, are, are really, really uh, secured. Um, they're, they're, they're in, let's say, in Galapagos, uh, there are really some areas only that you can, you can visit. You can't visit the whole thing. Um, there are um, um, in in Gunung Mulu that I, I, I said earlier. There are restrictions to the number of flights and uh, capacities that is um, can be uh, within the site itself, uh, and and that is controlled. And um, some some sites are are a little bit more open, but I think we need to really think about uh, these capacities because uh, it's called the carrying capacity of the site. Uh, and and uh, some some types of visitation will uh, will uh, affect the overall uh, significance of the site, the OUV. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, how do we uh, uh, how do we reconcile reconstruction with authenticity? So the historic core of Warsaw is a world heritage site, but it's completely reconstructed from scratch. Yeah, Any thoughts? Okay, so the, the Warsaw uh, uh, situation is slightly different uh, because it was inscribed not because of its authentic, if it's um, of the, let's say, the, the old fabric, but it is about the, the idea of people bringing it back to where they believe it should be. So they, they, it is, uh, if you read the, nominee or the inscription of that, they, they're not saying it's authentic at all. Zero. They're saying that they're saying that yes, it was destroyed, but it is the the, the community says we want to uh, uh, put back our our um, um, uh, community and uh, see it as as what we imagined it to be as part of our you know uh, heritage. So it, it's a it's a different way of thinking, but um, uh, it's a, it, it it is a different way of how they presented their argument. Uh, thank you for that, Gab. Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time for the Q&A because we would like to allot the next 15 minutes for a game. So we are going to have another round of the ILS mini quiz B. So, uh, but before we proceed that, maybe one last question. So, uh, Gab, what is your message to the young people here who are viewing us today? Uh, for those, the young people who would like to pursue this topic, in their further studies, uh, the I, I have a I before this um, while preparing like uh, while I was having lunch, I actually saw this very very interesting webinar uh, from De La Salle, which is like nakaka no speed ang heritage. 
and it was uh, um, uh, focusing on De La Salle students and how um, they can uh, contribute to, to, to heritage. And I think uh, Kay Malilong was, was there as well. And for, for me, the, for, for young people and for, for you know, uh, people who, who are starting out in their careers and are, who are passionate about heritage, um, the drive for, for thinking about uh, uh, what needs to be protected is a lifelong commitment. It is like even though you go for other professions, even if you're not in the heritage field, but uh, when you feel that you need to contribute, there's an advocacy, there's a passion in your heart, then you can, it's easy enough to, to be aware of uh, these um, conversations through organizations. So uh, I, I'm, I'm not trying to advocate different organizations, but, uh, you know, uh, various organizations can, can alert you and keep you going and sustain your interest. Um, there is a lot of knowledge out there, and hopefully when you, you get to, let's say, learn about sites, you also get a, a little bit more understanding of, of uh, the, the site significance, and then later on, uh, once you're, you, you, you become more aware, you, you fight for, for it as well with, you know, uh, with many people out there who are also passionate, uh, equally passionate uh, with you, but a little bit older. Yeah. Thank you for that. And for those who would like to ask questions further, uh, you can directly contact our speaker via his email. These are uh, flashed in the screen, so feel free to screenshot now. And if you'd like to know more about e-commerce Philippines, feel free to go to the e-commerce website, philippines.ecommerce.org. Now, we shall go to our game. So, the ILS Mini Quiz B. So, this is our second. So, if you'd like to join, go to menti.com or you can just uh, copy this uh, QR code from the screen. So if you join us and if you win, you get a chance to win an Intramuros team beep card, an Intramuros team t-shirt, an Intramuros team tote bag. So how do, you, how do you join? So anyone can join. Just go to menti.com, enter the code, which will be flashed in a bit. And please, please make sure to put your real name so that later when we give out the prizes, is a... Uh, can be verified more, uh, your identity can be verified more easy, easily. And most importantly, enjoy. So later, if you win, so how do you claim your prize? Make sure that, of course, again, I have to repeat this, make sure that you use your real name in the game. Then screenshot your phone. Make sure that you screenshot your phone or whatever device that you're using and email us the following, your screenshot, your complete mailing address, and at least a valid government issued ID. So make sure to go to the URL, menti.com, or just copy the uh, QR code. You'll be directed immediately to the quiz. So these are some of our Q uh, gift cards, so you get a chance to win. And then, right. So menti.com. Go to menti.com and enter this code 2779492. 2779492. Okay, so I'm going to wait, uh, siguro mga 10 seconds for you to join so that we can start immediately. So, 27. Uh, I'm sorry, starting. Wait. Uh, anyway. Okay, so uh, right. So that's our first question. Which one is not inscribed? Okay, that's right. The fortifications of Manila is not inscribed in the World Heritage List. So maybe we can proceed to the next question. Okay, question that this is very fast now. So in order for we, you need to not only get the answers right, you also need to be the fastest to answer. So question number two. Oh. Ninety-two people are currently in the game. So which one 
Which of the following is not included in the Philippines Natural World Heritage Sites? So, Tubata, the Puerto Princesa Subterranean National Park, Mount Amigitan, or Mayon Volcano National Natural Park. Three, two, one. Time's up. Okay, the correct answer is Mayon Volcano Natural Park. So, congratulations to the 69 who got that right. Then, next. Question three. For a moment, question three. UNESCO means, so what does it mean? So <laughs> the choices are in the screen. So is it UNESCO, Educa United Nations Educational Scientific and Cultural Office or Three, two, one. Time's up. Correct answer is United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. 37 people got it right. <clears throat> Question four. The Baroque churches of the Philippines as described in the World Heritage List are as follows, except San Agustin Church, Latsi Church, Pauai Church, Miagao Church. Three, two, one. It's Latsi Church, so it's not part of the listing. Question five. To be included in the World Heritage List, sites must be of outstanding universal value and meet at least one out of how many selection criteria? 10, 19, 18, or 20? So how many criteria are there for the selection of World Heritage Sites? Time's up. The answer is 10. There are 10 selection criteria. Question 6. So we have 10 questions. So this is the 6th. Vegan is qualified under selection criteria number 3. Yes or no? Uh, to bear a unique or at least exceptional testimony to a cultural tradition or to a civilization. Three, two, one. The answer is no. The answer is no. It is not criteria three. Question seven. The following are the advisory bodies of UNESCO, except IUCN, ICOMOS, ICROM, or ICOM. Three, two, one. The correct answer is ICOM, International Council of Museums. It is not part of the advisory body of UNESCO. Number eight. Uh, this group has the final say on whether a site is inscribed in the World Heritage List. So UNESCO Executive Board, the Credentials Committee, the World Heritage Committee, or ECOMOS. Time's up. 
The answer is World Heritage Committee. Question number nine. The Baroque Churches of the Philippines is qualified under criteria number one to represent a masterpiece of human creative genius. Yes or no? Three, two, one. The answer is no. So it is not part of selection criteria number one. Then lastly, question 10 out of 10. What is not part of the three pillars of the outstanding universal value? World Heritage Criteria, Comparative Analysis, Integrity, Authenticity, or Protection and Management? The okay, time's up. The answer is Comparative Analysis. So, we shall see who won. Our winner for today is Mr. Eagle Hada San Andres, followed by Mr. RJ Punong Bayan. Congratulations, Eagle. So to claim your prize, you can just email us the screenshot of your phone and the valid ID. So thank you everyone for joining us in our quiz. And uh, feel free to follow us in our social media channels. We are available on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. So feel free to subscribe. And uh, if you missed this session or if you came in late, don't worry because this session is recorded. And later we're going to upload in our YouTube channel. So just key in the Intramuros Administration uh, uh, in YouTube. And... We are also available in Google Arts and Culture, so just uh, write, just key in Intramuros Administration to view our digitized museum collection. Then uh, finally, we are calling for papers for the second Intramuros Young Scholars Conference. So this one is open to young professionals. So you must have completed an original undergraduate, undergraduate thesis in Intramuros and age must not be beyond 30 at the time of the presentation. So our conference is on November this year and only unpublished research will be accepted. For more info, you can get a copy of the call for papers in our website at intramuros.gov.ph and you can email us at archives at intramuros.gov.ph. And just to announce that Intramuros has been nominated as Asia's as 2020 Asia's leading tourist attraction in the World Travel Awards, Asian Asian edition. So how uh, how do you support us? So just go to worldtravelawards.com and then verify your account and then click Asia and then go to outstanding votes and vote for Intramuros as Asia's leading tourist attraction uh, for 2020. Okay. So, that's it for today. Um, Kev, would you like to say some final words before we end this webinar? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for, for that. Actually, I thought it was quite interesting that, uh, for the game because uh, a lot of people actually got the right answers. And uh, um, just a, a last uh, call for everyone. You know, uh, a heritage advocate doesn't need to be, or uh, you don't need to be older. You can be young and uh, be a heritage ad advocate. It's always in the heart. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, Gab. And thank you to all our viewers for today, to all those who viewed via Zoom and via Facebook. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And until next time, uh, but for now, good day. Thank you. And uh, till next time.